Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, the Eclectic Film Series Committee, in partnership with Digital Matters, has gathered together today um, with our expert panelists to discuss the film Coded Bias. Um, this film um, explores MIT researcher Joy Bulam Bimni's startling discovery that facial recognition does not see dark skin faces accurately and her journey to push for the first ever legislation in the US to govern against bias in the algorithms that impact us all. If you were unable to watch this film before today's discussion, um, I'm going to show my screen and uh, show you where you can look up that film. So if you go to lib.utah.edu and then in that search bar there, search for coded bias, 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 pardon. And then over here on the left is the results from the catalog. If you click on coded bias there, it shows that we, we do have a physical copy available, but we also have online access. So you can just click right there to watch the film. Um, if you're interested in this film and other films, if you go to the library webpage, there's a entry right there for databases. You can search by type, like videos, or you can do by subject. And so we're going to do film and media arts. And this shows all the databases that we have access to. Um, one thing that's really popular is uh, Digitalia, um, Film on Demand, which is kind of like PBS things. And another one that's really popular is Swank. So we have a lot of databases. It really kind of focuses on your um, what your preferences and what your interests are. But there are also some fun, like cinematic ones that you can do as well. So thank you so much for letting me share those library resources. And I hope you take advantage of it. Um, let me uh, turn the time over to Rebecca Cummings. Um, she's going to be our facilitator for this discussion. Um, she's the interim director for Digital Matters. Rebecca? Great. Thank you so much, Angela. And thanks to the Eclectic Film Committee for partnering with Digital Matters to host this discussion of coded bias. I'm so excited for it today. Um, so we are fortunate to have some wonderful panelists to help us make sense of this incredibly like complicated and alarming documentary film for those of you who have who have watched it. Um, some of us were able to gather a couple weeks ago in the library and watch Coded Bias together. Um, I'm sure some of you have watched it on your own, maybe more than once. Um, and it's possible that some of you have not yet watched the film. And so I, I appreciate Angela showing us how to access that film, which is available in perpetual streaming through the Marriott Library. Um, but for those of you who haven't seen it, like Angela said, the film follows the work of Joy Bulam Wini, who is an MIT researcher, who stumbles across the fact that facial recognition software couldn't identify her face and couldn't identify darker faces and women's faces as readily as it was able to identify um, white male faces. And that was simply because of the training data sets that the technology had access to that taught the technology what a face actually is. Um, and then the film after that kind of takes us on a journey of how artificial intelligence and machine learning are increasingly becoming gatekeepers for a wide variety of issues. A lot of um, everything that might go from what communities are being surveilled to who has access to high quality health insurance or health care um, to who's being hired or considered for particular jobs. I mean, the the stretch of decisions being made in automated fashion was really um, concerning to me as we watched this video. So. Um, so I recently watched a different panel discussion about coded bias where Van Jones referred to the film as a four alarm fire. I thought that was a really accurate description of this film. He compared it to Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth that came out, you know, 15 years or so and really, really heightened awareness of climate change and what an issue that is for us. And that's what coded bias is doing for us in regards to um, artificial intelligence, the decisions it's making, um, surveillance, and a whole host of other issues. So that being said, I'm now going to introduce our panel who's going to help us wade through some of these complicated issues. Um, we are so fortunate today to have David Rowe, who is a professor of English at the University of Utah. We have Sarah Sinwell, who is a pro associate professor of film and media arts at the University of Utah. 
And we also have Trevor Smith, who's a recently graduated master's student in communication, whose final master's thesis was on critical approaches to generative artificial intelligence. Um, before we jump into the questions, I would just love to hear from our panel, maybe for a minute or two for each of you on what brought you to issues around artificial intelligence, machine learning, maybe the ethical implications of some of these technologies. So, uh, David, let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation to participate in the panel. Um, so I've always been interested in um, the guardrails for technology, uh, as much as I'm an advocate and have sort of uh, an optimistic streak about the potential for technology in all you know all facets of our lives. I'm I am also cautious and skeptical at times. Uh, I think there's just kind of undeserved, uh, sometimes um, wellspring of goodwill that we have towards technology without really understanding how it could go sideways <laughs> in many ways uh, without the proper kind of regulatory oversight. Um, and so this film kind of dovetails with all those uh, sort of ethical concerns I've, I've had for a long time. Yeah, that's great. And I, I am happy to hear that there is a streak of optimism in there because I'm not going to lie, leaving the film, I felt a little bit despondent. Um, Sarah, do you mind giving us a little introduction? So I saw this film at Sundance. Sundance did a special screening online of this, and then they had an online Q&A with the director. And I, I always jump at any opportunity to see a Q&A with the director of a film. So I, I've actually seen this film multiple times, and I, I would have seen anything that Sundance would present with regard to who, who's coming afterwards to do a Q&A. But this particular film interested me because I'm interested in media technology and these kind of issues at larger issues. But one of the things I thought was especially interesting about this film is it starts with a graduate student's research. And I, I just find that as I teach graduate students at the U myself and I just find the, the possibilities of what a graduate researcher can discover. And also I was really moved when I was watching this again to think about how actual change is being made. She's being, you know, giving, uh, uh, she's talking to the Congress about changes to how we impact um, this use of AI. So I, I really was kind of struck by the idea that it starts with a graduate student and that we can continue this discussion and they, they interview, of course, lots of experts in the field that, that I've read. So I was going to talk in a few minutes about some of those people's books I've already was familiar with and now I'm seeing them in the documentary. So. Yeah, that's true. It's a very empowering um, position there that a graduate student could affect all this change. change. Exactly. I love that. Trevor, can we hear from you? Yes, I'd love to talk. Um, I kind of originally got into um, this particular area of research. It's kind of embarrassing to say, embarrassing to say but through my love of science fiction, um, which I think is often for me kind of turns into this morbid fascination with things that simultaneously, you know, terrify me, but I also kind of obsess over because I think they're so fascinating. And, and, and for me, AI was definitely that, especially, you know, AI that generates new content, which is kind of the subject of my research. And then, and then secondarily, you know, it wasn't really originally going to be the primary research I did during my master's, but after receiving uh, the fellowship from Digital Matters, I it kind of turned into my number one thing. So I had Digital Matters to thank as well. Oh. That is so great to hear. So I have some questions kind of queued up for the panel, but I, we would love to hear from people who are joining us on Facebook Live. Um, go ahead and comment on Facebook Live if you have some questions, and I think Jordan will feed those over to us in the Zoom chat. Um, and so, yeah, we'd love to hear from you as well. But I will start with a few questions, and I'm going to ask different panelists to kind of lead off. But that's just a jumping off point. I'd love to hear from each of the panelists on these questions if you if you have something to contribute. So I will start off by directing the first question to Sarah, though. Um, so coded bias, as you were just mentioning, interviews a dynamic group of scholars and advocates who are mostly women of color on the subject of artificial intelligence. What information or interviews stood out to you while you were watching the film, and why do you think they resonated with you? So, like I said, I, I it definitely resonated with me that it starts with a graduate student and how much political change she's creating as part of this documentary, and, and in terms of you know U.S. policy, even she's impacting policy changes, which I always we always think about like how do you actually create change, not just think about how you can change AI, but actually create change. And there's such evidence of that in this film. 
But the other thing that was really interesting to me is, and I think this is also relevant to a lot of the work that Digital Matters is doing, because we've had discussions of, for example, Sophia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression. We've had discussions of um, weapons of math destruction. We're, we're, we as a group have been thinking about these issues even before the documentary came out. And I personally work on Twitter. So a lot of these scholars also talk about Twitter and Google searches and things like that. And I, one thing that was really interesting to me is I was already following some of these people on Twitter, like mm -hmm. um, Safia Noble, for example, and also um, uh, Tufetsky, who wrote the book Twitter, Twitter and Tear Gas. And I was following them pre-pandemic. And now during the pandemic, there's kind of been like a resurgence of interest, I think, in these kinds of technology questions, because as, as we are right here, we're, we're all on Zoom, we're, we're really kind of so informed by our technology now that I think there's kind of been a resurgence of interest in like how impacted we are by technology and what kind of role that has in our everyday lives. And I think one of a lot of these interviews kind of spoke to the question of A, the things we don't notice about technology, right? Like how, how our Facebook or our Twitter or any of those accounts are feeding us information and feeding us advertisements and feeding us, you know, all sorts of, um, all sorts of things that we, we don't even think about as we think about how we use our technology. And then again, the larger issues that the film deals with, like for things like healthcare and um, imprisonment, all of these sorts of housing was a really big one that I was really interested in. And again, how these issues that you don't think about, like housing, how housing is being impacted by these technologies. So I think um, a lot of these, these people that are being interviewed in the film, I think they're really trying to think about how we can directly create change and how this impacts you know, marginalized peoples in particular, because those are the people that they're trying out these technologies on, right? So yeah, I'm curious to hear what other people think too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting how in the film there was the, the housing that they were trying to use the face recognition to go into the apartment building. And they're like, well, why why does our apartment need to be like Fort Knox? Why does it need to be this secure? Yeah, I was so impressed with the range of expertise in the film. I mean, I felt like I could have curated like a reading list just off of everyone that was um in the film, um, another another person that was featured was Virginia Eubanks, who's also been you know featured in the Digital Matters New Media Studies Reading Group. We read her book uh, Automating Inequality, I think, two years ago now, and I think that gave me a little bit more insight on some of the training data sets that you know because uh, the film you know it's ninety minutes, so it's only able to touch on some of these issues, which is why it's great to dig in a little deeper with all you. Hey, David, Trevor, I could jump to the next question, or did you have anything to add here? Okay. All right, great. So um, Trevor, I'm going to direct this next question to you. So, you know, um, Sarah just mentioned like with AI, we're all sort of aware how it like generates our advertisements and stuff and some of the maybe the news feeds that we see on the internet. But I was really struck when watching Coded Bias by how embedded artificial intelligence has become in our daily lives and the, the degree to which it affects really important decisions, you know, such as like how long someone's prison sentence might be or like what healthcare is available to them. Is there a particular aspect of artificial intelligence that like keeps you up at night? I mean, what about this technology do you find the most concerning? Because it's probably not what advertisements we're seeing on Facebook. Right. I, I think, you know, in, in this, this film mentioned it too, but a lot of my research is also centered around AI that learns as it works, right? And perpetually uses kinds of tests to see how close it is getting to actual human decision-making. So I think the thing that that scares me the most is when, is the, the idea that these AI could already be, be getting good enough to pass a Turing test, right? Or to be indiscernible from human de decision-making. Because I think that brings up a ton of questions as far as how we value them, what jobs we put them in, the ethics of them. And then I, I come from a family of lawyers, so I can't help but thinking of the liability of, of AI, AI decision-making, especially when it gets not only embedded into the decisions our society makes, but um, impossible to discern that it's an AI doing it and not a human. I think that really scares me. Mm -hmm. 
keeps me up at night, like you said. Isn't that when we reach singularity? <laughs> yeah, there, there's that too. Yeah, which or, or when or even just the idea that they could get so good at imitating humans that they could be more human in, in, in some elements of what that means, right? They could get better by whatever metric you want to use at doing what they're designed to do, then, then we could do it. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the legal aspect of it. I actually had a, a conversation last night with the Utah um, ACLU director talking about like the rollback of civil civil liberties with some of this technology, which maybe we'll get into in this discussion. But it just gave me another thing that keeps me up at night that all the the progress we've made in things like fair housing or, you know, um, discrimination when it comes to hiring practices, like AI has the potential to roll back some of those things. And that really terrified me as well. Hey, Trevor, you mentioned that uh, you come from a family of uh, legal scholars and lawyers. And so I was wondering about this with respect to uh, AI, like where does the liability lie, right? Because if you have a company that produces or uses an AI for their, some of the decision-making process, they actually have kind of a legal and financial in investment in defending the AI as perfect, right? right. If it makes a mistake, uh, they go, it, doesn't, it doesn't serve them to say, oh yeah, we messed up or there's some mistake here, right? And so it's, 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 a, it's a weird kind of tension where the AI is supposedly kind of, they're offloading a lot of decision-making onto the AI, uh, but um, at the same time, like uh, there's an investment into just like uh, saying that, you know, it's, it's the perfect sort of intermediary and it's flawless. And if you come at us with an accusation that it's wrong, then we're gonna defend it to the death because it's all part of our workflow and processes. Right. There's, it, it's, I, I think it's interesting. And that's, this is something I was thinking about in regards to the first question as well, that I really thought that the film did a good job explaining um, succinctly and effectively that it challenges kind of the Western conception that anything that's empirical, anything that's automatic is therefore perfect and unarguable. Right. But at the same time, we, we, we consider it lesser than us and, and, less valuable and less less human obviously but I, I think the the thing that freaks me out with the legal stuff is is that the technologies are are developing faster than we can come up with precedent or legislation you know um to to regulate and to litigate um and i think you know a really good visible example of that and even in a really not simple but relatively simple case is just self-driving cars and the litigation and ai that goes into that right that even those questions of liability are complicated and uh, we haven't even figured that out yet. And we're, we're already talking about, you know, technologies that can send people to prison incorrectly and things like that. Yeah. We actually just got an audience question in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and engage the audience. Uh, this question is from Greg Hatch and Greg asks, as the relatively new field of AI technology is developed, deployed, researched, analyzed, and refined, I'm interested in the, the panelists' thought on the ethical implications of deploying imperfect technologies, particularly, particularly those that have been found to amplify racial bias. How else could a potentially powerful tool like this be developed without crossing this ethical boundary? I actually have some thoughts about that as everyone's been talking. I, I was really struck re-watching the film about the corporatization of AI, how like the tools that they're using are made by Amazon or Google or Facebook, mm -hmm. and how that's just a limited, a limited list of organizations, right? They said there's nine big ones. Mm -hmm. So there's a very limited list. They're all in the US and China. And the fact that you know the police or our healthcare systems are using technologies that are designed by corporations to sell products, I think is incredibly problematic, right? And I and I feel like we we again we're taking all these technologies for granted and taking these kind of companies' involvement for granted. But something that continues to strike me, especially after rewatching the film, is just this idea that that a federal organization or a state-run organization or a nonprofit organization or whatever it might be would use the technology that's not designed for with the, like I think a lot of those, um, the people in the documentary were talking about like the social good, that they're not designed for social good, they're designed to sell a product, right? So I think that that understanding that, that we, that we need to think more about who's designing this product with what purpose. And even if we're reusing that product, like mm -hmm. what, what kind of, what does, whose interest does that serve? And I think that question of like, 
why marginalized communities are so greatly impacted by these technologies as part of that conversation. And I'm not sure that's the conversation happening at Facebook or Google or Amazon, right? Right. I, I thought it was interesting in the film too, to see how it's being deployed in China versus um, the United States, you know, that, um, you know, that, that China, it is more of like a, a government, you know, deployed and researched operation. And here it's more commercial based. Um, I just thought that it was fascinating in real time. We can kind of see these two case studies and the various issues with both. It doesn't seem like either one is like um, certainly optimizing privacy or personal liberties or anything like that. Yeah, I, I think I want to answer, oh, sorry, really quick. Uh, I think Often the the wrong answer to this question, I would say, is Facebook's internal motto of move fast and break things. I think we can all agree that's like the wrong attitude, right? With developing, but that still sometimes feels like that's what's happening. I mean, Rebecca, you've read my my paper. It's it's shocking that, you know, even in the time it's taken me to graduate four months ago, there's new case studies that I'm like, oh, I really should have talked about that. Maybe I have to rewrite my whole paper. But that's just just to reflect like the speed. Of, of the development, I think is, is also just really shocking and concerning, especially, it just doesn't feel like something could happen so fast with appropriate ethical considerations in place. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, I think guardrails was the good term you used earlier. We need some of those to make sure that we're doing this in a way that, you know, retain some of the things that we value in a democratic society. So I see- uh, Actually, I just wanted to, oh, to, sure. to, to add to that, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, so this is actually not a new dynamic at all, employing, deploying technologies that are an extension of existing corporate or state power that, uh, har that negatively harms black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. So think about you know the infrastructure building of the interstate highway system. It's no accident that a lot of the highways just cut through black and brown communities and divided those communities and brought a lot of destruction. And we hopefully learn from that process. And now when we have these huge governmental works projects or uh, infrastructure building projects, we have a whole system in place where those communities can give feedback and make sure that they are represented uh, so that when we do build out these things that the, you know, all, the, all of the interests are uh, able to communicate. But with AI right now, because there aren't any guardrails or formal regulations, there's no feedback mechanism, right? We just have to rely on the goodwill of Amazon or Facebook or whoever to take those considerations into account. They have no responsibility to do so. They have no legal responsibility to do so some right now. And so uh, we need uh, sort of an intervention or so that that mechanism is in place for those interests to be represented. Yeah. So we have one audience question, but I'm going to jump to one other question on mine and then go back to the audience question. And David, um, since we're going down this path, I'm going to direct this one to you, okay? So encoded bias, uh, Joy Bulamwini shows how the biases and inaccuracies in artificial intelligence can cause all kinds of problems, such as wrongfully accusing people of crimes, which there's a great example of that in the film where a 14-year-old was accused. And I mean, the, I think the statistics are like 85% that you know, that people are wrongfully identified. Um, but it's also possible to imagine a future where facial recognition technology improves dramatically and is nearly perfect at identifying faces. But there might be significant concerns there as well. So I believe someone in the film referred to this potential future as optimizing oppression. Can you speak to the concerns surrounding surveillance and civil liberties in a world of perfect facial recognition? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, I mean, that, that we kind of dovetails into what we were just talking about, how if that technology, and I do, I'm actually skeptical about this idea of uh, perfect facial recognition, <laughs> but if hypothetically it came to be, uh, we would need some kind of legal framework <laughs> for uh, making sure that power isn't abused, right, by the state or by criminal interests, by whoever, whoever has uh, hand, their hands on the technology. Um, and this, it, this is actually part of a larger discussion that has preceded AI and the rise of AI. I mean, even when CCTVs are starting to crop up all over England, there was a discussion about surveillance and how uh, penetrating and uh, invasive it all is. With AI on top of all that, it could become even more powerful, more robust, right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, goes to this larger argument that has been um, in legal circles about how, you know, you'll hear from the outside, like the CIA, whoever will say, if you got nothing to hide, why does this bother you, right? If you're a good citizen, why why do you 
why do you care if we have your your face on your face in our database right but that that's really flips the that's a really a perversion of our principle of the right to be loved alone at least here in the united states right it is not up to me to prove that i'm you know an upstanding citizen it's up to you to prove that i am worthy of surveillance right but if everyone is being surveilled that changes your behavior, regardless of whether you're a criminal or just a normal person walking around the street. If you are aware that every single interaction that you have in public or even private is being recorded or surveilled, then you start to kind of second guess yourself, right? You, you, you act like you are being surveilled, right? Mm -hmm. And with AI, there is no private space anymore. What are you doing on your computer? You know, what are you doing at home? You know, that can penetrate uh, those, those, you know, conventional physical barriers, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, there's an erosion of privacy that goes beyond what, you know, the framers of the constitution ever imagined, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are the legal frameworks that we have in place or can we put in place to kind of build those rights back outward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and this is why I love having a literature scholar on the panel too, because I feel like there's this whole body of literature that explores these possible futures where we all live under surveillance. And I think if we're familiar with that, those works, it, it should give us pause of how much, um, you know, entree we allow the government to have in our every aspect of our lives. Um, okay, thank you, David. Um, let's see. So we have, again, we have, it's so great to have all this audience participation. Um, I'm going to jump back to an audience question and then maybe we'll go back to one of mine. Um, so Eliana Massey, who's one of our current Digital Matters interns, asks, um, and you can tell she's a philosophy major here, do you think crowdsourcing sh uh, should be used for on ontology engineering in artificial intelligence? I think I can answer this to a smaller scale. I think, you know, I'm not super, I haven't done a ton of work with like the ontology of AI itself, but I think with with um, my research about AI making art, I think what, I, I think most people are like, it's a really cool idea to crowdsource all of humanity to make human-like AI. But I feel like so frequently, while that noble, that aim is is noble, the, the sourcing that we do is inevitably going to be biased. Um, I think in, in the case of my research, it's always pulled from just like the vast archives of the internet, right? Which to us as like Western people, we're like, yes, everything that ever exists, all human thoughts on the internet, right? But really it's it's not. And even the stuff that is, isn't, um, it's not like, I guess, organized in a way that's that's fair or unbiased. And, and so I think it's a really cool idea but really hard in practice to do in a way that isn't just replicating the already kind of pro-Western elements of, of at least the internet, if we're doing the crowdsourcing there. Yeah. yeah I, I can speak okay. to that a little bit um, because um, I think what the question is driving at is what is sort of the way forward where AI can be built ethically and that speaks to the problem of the black box, right? A lot of AI technology, machine learning algorithms are proprietary. And so we don't know actually how it works, except for the companies and the engineers of whichever company had built them out. And so by opening them up and making them open source and having the entire community be able to read and understand how they work, then they can see the flaws, the gaps, and that will force the companies or whoever wants to contribute to it, an amateur working in their spare time to be able to uh, make it more robust or uh, you know fill those holes. Again, but that, that should go according to larger you know justice oriented uh, principles but that's a kind of a different discussion mm -hmm. i mean while we're starting starting to talk about like how the sausage is made and how this technology gets developed i have a couple questions around that um so joy's work again sort of challenges the idea that technology is this neutral decision maker and immune to human bias can can someone talk, and this is to anyone on the panel who feels comfortable addressing this, but can you talk about how human bias gets embedded in code and what steps, if any, we can take to mitigate that bias? I mean, I will just say Trevor gave a great talk in Digital Matters a couple semesters ago, and we had an undergraduate CS student who actually made the comment data can't be racist. And then all, you know, everybody in there was like, well, ah, it, it led to a great discussion, but I think there is this idea that like data can't be, but we've also seen obviously that it is. So who can speak to that? Yeah, I think just really quick again, I, I think that um, the idea of, of the positive impact of representation in media has, has been challenged recently as, as maybe 
not as effective or as important as, as we, we previously thought as critical scholars. But I think that uh, Sophia Noble, especially in, in Algorithms of Oppression, makes a really good case for why representation is important in developing code. Um, and that's like, I, I don't know if that's like a perfect solution, but I think it's a really good one and maybe the best we have. <laughs> but I think, yeah, representation in, in, in coding is extremely important, maybe more even than in, in just media representation, um, just because it, it, um, it has such an important impact as shown by this documentary. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the documentary say like something like 14% of the coding is made by women and people of color, something like that? So I feel like that's definitely part of the conversation, right? Is that the people who are doing the coding are being, you know, are being impacted in different ways than the people who are not doing coding. So I think that's, that's definitely an important factor to keep in mind. I think that again, like what's striking about the documentary is how all these women and people of color are being interviewed and the way they're engaging with things like Google search algorithms or any of these sorts of technologies, I think is really an important part of the discussion as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was something that resonated with me early in the film that if, if someone that looked like Joy weren't testing the software, we may never have known that facial recognition software was, was so terrible at identifying darker faces and female faces. And it was only through someone who was involved in development that that bias was able to be identified. And yeah, then, that, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, David. I'm sorry. That just speaks to the importance of when these technologies are developed from the, the ground level, even in the planning stage, you need a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. So all those interests are represented. I was, my, my son, it just turned two and a couple of months ago he had to have an eye exam and the nurse came in with her, her little device and said all right we're going to take this eye exam just fair warning this eye exam actually fails usually when it's tested on asian americans because the company that made it didn't bother to test it on asian people <laughs> and so you know it might give false positives or you know have inaccurate readings about uh, you know the state of his eyes and so that again is sort of a tangible, and that's that's that's, tech, that's not with AI. It's with every aspect of technology. You got to have that uh, consideration, testing in mind, or else you know people are going to fall through the cracks. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, and and Sarah, you had mentioned the fourteen percent of of technologists are women. I mean, I think an important aspect of AI is that the premise of it is using historical data to predict the future as if we couldn't make changes in there and do improvements. So when the AI algorithm in the, in the movie was deciding who was qualified to work as a programmer, they were eliminating every single female applicant because they were using historical data to say what would be true in the future. I just thought that was um, just something we should be more aware of. I was thinking of the moment in the documentary when they're, when she's giving her statement to Congress Mm -hmm. I'm just fascinated by the idea that they could film that moment, first of all, <laughs> so I'm fascinated by that. But secondly, I, I was really struck by how the people in Congress were entirely unaware of all of these things. So that that really was striking, too, to think about. I think one of the they were describing they were getting some information from driver's license information, and it's from like half of the states in America. And I was thinking mm -hmm. about which states, right? <laughs> like which states and how are people of color and women represented in those states, right? Like, and, and just the concept of that, I think was really fascinating in the film as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I heard a statistic that 110 um, Americans are in, like our, our faces are in a facial recognition system already. So, I mean, it's just, it's so prevalent already. Um, we do have uh, another audience question that I'm going to direct towards the panel. Uh, so Molly Steed asks, many of the algorithms discussed in the film came under fire because of how they perpetuate existing biases and stereotypes. But it seems like AI could also be programmed to do the opposite. Are there cases where this type of technology is being used to encourage rather than stagnate or reverse positive social change? I, I think so I when I started my project, I was maybe differently than David. I was I was extremely critical of AI and I didn't really plan on adding any nuance to that take <laughs> throughout my whole paper. But luckily one of my committee members was Dr. Ashley Cortez, who who was a fellow here as well. And and she introduced me to, you know, indigenous epistemologies, 
and how they regard AI. And I think that um, that was kind of like a eureka moment for me when I read some of those pieces to think about that even I in, in being hypercritical of AI and, and almost like belittling it as less than human, how I could kind of improve my research by considering different ways to be in a relationship with the non-human other than just the Western classic humans are, are the pinnacle of existence and creation. So I can send in the chat. There's, there's a piece I love that is, it's kind of a collation of different indigenous groups perspectives about relation relationality with AI and, and how, um, how their different epistemologies might treat AI differently than, than Western epistemology. So I can include that, but I, I think, a lot of the the work that indigenous scholars are doing with AI and technology is just really, really, really inspiring and, and amazing. I feel like Trevor just threw out a librarian challenge. Like if anyone can go find that article and drop it in the Facebook chat. <laughs> it's like one of those things where the book is blue. Can you go find it for me? Just posted a link. Oh my so. gosh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> yeah. found it. If you're interested, that's a great piece. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> that That's great. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and that does make me feel a little bit hopeful too. Like just, again, just because things have been problematic in the past doesn't mean they can't be improved in the future ways that we think about technology and deploy that technology. Um, yeah, I think uh, it helps to keep in mind the limitations of technology um, because, because the general populace doesn't really understand how AI works. They, like the film says, ascribe kind of magical properties to it. Like it just seems like this wondrous, you know, uh, magician in, up in the sky doing things. Uh, but when you understand how it operates and you can see it has severe limitations and it gets things wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and just keeping that in mind can then reframe our thinking about technology and AI so that we use it as a tool, supplementary, complementary tool, rather than this kind of end all be all solution to all things, right? Um, uh, I'm going to give another historical example about uh, previous analog technology uh, that had some of the same problems, right? Like photography, we consider it to be objective, uh, to this thing that just kind of captures the world as it is. But all the film stock and the chemical processes that went through the manufacturing them were all attuned to capturing white skin and white people on film. They were really calibrated to black, people, black or brown people. And so you had this whole generation of photographers who just never knew how to understand or never knew how to kind of compensate for that. And then once those limitations start to get into um, the popular consciousness and discussion that happened around it, then they could start to see those limitations and correct them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a push and pull between the technological conversation and the social cultural conversation that will hopefully uh, align, align those interests and have that technology work for the, for the better. Mm -hmm. It's so great to be reminded that these issues are not new issues. They're just being embedded in different new technologies. Okay, which this has been sort of touched on, but I'm hoping we can go a little deeper with this because I think this is going to be one of the big, um, you know, a pushback someone might give with the film. So, or, or push back to surveillance in general. So it's not difficult to imagine a person who learns about artificial intelligence and facial recognition technology and is like, well, I don't have anything to hide. So I don't have a problem with my face being in a database if it helps law enforcement, for example, catch more bad guys. Um, and maybe it makes the world a little bit safer. How would our panel respond to that? If you were talking to that person, what would you say to them? Sorry, so this is a person who <laughs> is all for surveillance technologies and no limits. Well, just you know, maybe whatever. they don't know a lot about surveillance technology, but you know, just with the passing understanding of it saying, well, I don't mind if yeah. my face is in a database, you know, if it helps us catch more criminals, make the world safer. Sure. What, what I can you give you an example. About? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I, I'll, I'll shut up. I'll just get a real quick example. But there was recently a case uh, where a father um, I'm a father, so it scares the crap out of me, uh, who had this son uh, had come down with some kind of illness and um, the, he was corresponding with his doctor over you know, my chart or whatever. And the doctor said, okay, and he said, oh, my son's penis is really like inflamed. And the doctor said, okay, we'll send us pictures of, of that area 
and uh, you know we'll take a look at it and correspond. And so he did, and uh, he was using he had Google Photos on his phone and, and automatically uploaded to his Google Photos uh, archive. And Google's algorithms flagged him as a pedophile and say, oh, you're, you're human trafficking, you're a pedophile. And so they shut down all of his accounts. He couldn't access any of his work accounts or his home accounts. He's completely you know, separated from his digital life. And he had no idea how to like rectify the issue. There's no like real process for correcting this. It's, but the algorithm had made its judgment. And so he was totally screwed and <laughs> he still doesn't have access to it there's no appeals process or nothing he can do and that's the case of the algorithm falsely uh you know accusing somebody of a crime that he didn't commit uh because he was doing what he thought it was right um and there's no recourse right and so th the question then is okay is that one person having his whole life blown up because of this algorithm this faceless algorithm that he can't ever spot speak back to is that worth you know your your that you know the loss of those rights and it could happen to him it could happen to you it could happen to anybody is that worth you know this hypothetical solution where we're catching more criminals um i mean i'm, I'm the thing i would push back on this person would say well, this has got to be a better balance struck you can't just have it you know completely one way or the other yeah yeah, I think I'd say in the nicest way possible and as a privileged person, just to like reevaluate how your privilege relates or influences your relationship with law enforcement and government. Um, yeah, which is, is simple, but that's, you know, I think, you know, as, as especially as a white person, I continually have to do that, especially when I'm like, well, maybe it wouldn't be that bad, which I don't really think. But, you know, it's, I think it's important just to always reassess how our identity is giving privilege, especially as it relates to, you know, law enforcement and, and politics and things like that. There's actually another really good book it was not mentioned in this film. There were several in the film, but it's called the right. You have the right to remain innocent. And it talks about your sixth amendment rights and how, because there's so many laws that are on the books, you may not, I mean, we all sort of break laws every day and we're just not even aware of it. And, you know, it's sort of you're doing it in a way where it's not harming anybody. We just don't get caught. But when you have this perfect surveillance system, you know, it, it's sort of interesting what you might end up getting, you know, that allows police to intrude in our lives in ways that that previously the law protected us from. I mean, one that comes in mind with facial recognition is that there are several states that allow undocumented Im immigrants to have a driver's license. That's perfectly legal in the state that they live in. And yet we're also aware that different government agencies are using the, the facial recognition databases, you know, gathering these photographs um, of, of people doing legal things, but they could use it to convict them of different crimes. And I think that's where I start feeling really nervous about, you know, and it would scare me to think that an undocumented immigrant might not take advantage of their legal ability to drive in their state because they don't want their face included and be able to be surveilled in their state. I mean, there's just so many instances like that where I feel like the unintended consequences of this technology could be really dire, especially for particular communities. One of the ideas from the film I really, um, I've given some thought to is one of the people who was being interviewed suggested that we need an, F, um, an FDA for mm -hmm. AI. And I was thinking about that, just like, what would that look like? Who, who would be on that committee, right? Like all those sorts of questions. I, I want, I would like to create an FDA for algorithmic issues, but I, I don't know who would be put on that committee besides Safia Noble and the people that are being interviewed here. But I, I mean, I think it's really interesting to that concept is really interesting. I mean, do we all agree? I mean, I, I agree with Sarah that there should be some kind of regulation around this technology. Does anyone have an idea of what that might look like or who might be informing that? Because I look at our, our, you know, a lot of our decision makers and our Congress, and I don't know if they have like deep knowledge of technology or the ethical implications of technology so what would what would an fda for algorithms look like i mean i feel like the precedent for media technology is frequently self-regulation which isn't a perfect solution but you know i think like with film that's been a solution especially that might help with um issues of that uh, rebecca mentioned of, of just not knowing you know what an ai is and, and what it's doing if you're you know 78 or whatever but um I think, yeah, I think self-regulation could be an answer, especially since, you know, it'd be asking the people who are in power and have the funds uh, to do it themselves as opposed to, I don't know, that, that's just an option. I don't really feel very strongly about it now that it comes out of my mouth, but I think that is a possibility. 
you know, I, I think about this a lot because I'm a film professor and the MPAA that makes decisions about whether a film is rated R or PG-13 or PG. A, it's a really old institution um, at this stage. And B, I think it's really important to note that it is not a, um, we don't know who's on that committee and the process of who's on the committee and how these things are determined is invisible. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something we would certainly would not want to replicate <laughs> where we to create this sort of um, organization for AI work, because I think the fact that it's invisible, the fact that we don't know who's on the committee, the fact that we don't know how these ratings are determined and the fact that it has larger um, institutional implications. So certain theaters won't show an NC-17 rated film, for example, and that's why you don't want an NC-17 rating because mm -hmm. suddenly you may not be able to get your film screened in all the cinemas across mm -hmm. the United States. So I think this is definitely something we're thinking about is like who's on the committee and what are the structures that are put into place to determine how, how these regulations would be implemented. I think I'm gonna, uh, oh, go ahead, David. I'll just, I'm gonna blue sky and say that we should tax these companies and use that funds to uh, collect a bunch of academics and researchers and, and legal scholars to become that regulatory oversight committee. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I, I think I was gonna say as well that when Rebecca first asked the question, my gut reaction was like, well, I don't want a robot in the committee. But then <laughs> but then the more I thought about it, I was like, well, you know, I mean, if, if these develop to a point, is that just the the Western humans are our peak, you know, masters of all non-human. And then I was like, well, maybe we should have a robot on the committee, you know what I mean? Maybe that would be good. Maybe the best among AI in the future should, should at least have a seat on the committee to, because I mean, if depending on you know the level of, of how much they're thinking for themselves and stuff like that but I don't think that's a, a at first I thought that was kind of silly to mention but I think it actually probably is important at some point to think of well maybe AI should be involved in the decisions we're making about it at some point if it's getting better and better at making decisions so the the good news is that all of this conversation has started pressuring these companies to self-regulate um, so you see, you know, a bunch of press releases coming out from different companies saying that we're, you know, concerned about ethics, about yada, yada, yada. Uh, next month, I'm going to Meta uh, to speak with their, you know, virtual reality teams because they're really concerned about how they're going to build out these virtual worlds in a safe way that's respectful. And they want to make sure, you know, that they get the input from like a wide spectrum of, of academics like myself who work on recent technology. Um, and I'm going to go because, you know, they're going to wine and dine us, but I'm also like a little <laughs> cautious because I'm like, you know, it's, if they're going to, you know, put us up at this nice hotel and, and like kind of jazz us and, you know, put the wool over our eyes. I don't know if that's necessarily the best thing for self-regulation, right? Cause they're going to like, we're going to, you know, be entranced by all their nice, you know, facilities and all the great food and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily a good idea for them to self-regulate like that. I think maybe there should be some kind of independence and, uh, you know, fewer fringe benefits. And then you're going to end up on a billboard where it's like, ethicist David Rowe gives our algorithms the thumbs up. <laughs> I mean, I was planning on saving this question for last, but I feel like we could talk about this for a little bit because, I mean, full transparency, I actually tried to get researchers from the University of Utah who work in, like, who develop artificial intelligence to be on the panel. I was unable to get anyone. Um, but I still very strongly feel like there is a role for humanists in this space. And that's why we're having this panel discussion today. So all four of us on the panel are humanists with backgrounds in literature, communications, philosophy, film and media arts. And so my question for the panel, and David, you know, kind of started leading us down this path, but what role do you see for humanists in the development of technology and specifically artificial intelligence? I think um, I was, and I think Rebecca and David were there at my, my talk in, in fall, to, it was I was really intimidated because I, I had had to get into a lot of really techie computer science definitions to to kind of work on the the conceptualization I was going with. And then when I was presenting it to this you know classroom full of like CS students, I was really worried they're going to be like, oh, that's so wrong. Like the way you define this and that is like not correct at all. And then so you know I give them kind of my conceptualization of what an algorithm is, what an artificial intelligence is, and and so on and so forth. They're like, yeah, that's great. Or you know, that's, we haven't really thought about it. And I'm like, really, you haven't thought about like how to define these categories of 
of um, of different technologies and, and how we can label them. And I think that, you know, that kind of conceptual work and that kind of definitional work is not only really important, but also something that um, humanists excel at. And I'm not saying that CS students or CS scholars don't, but I, I personally love that work. So I'm, I'm happy to do that part of it for them. Uh, I, I thought it was telling that the end of the film ends with poetry. Right. Uh, the, I forgot who it was, but she starts to recite some of the poems that she had written uh, based on her research. Um, and that kind of speaks to the crucial uh, imperative to have humanists involved, because there is something about aesthetics, there's something about art, uh, something about sort of broader, indefinable, intangible uh, forms about what it means to be human that has to be intersecting with uh, this discussion. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was Joy's that. poem. Yeah, that was. Um, yeah. I, and I also was struck rewatching it this time by that song at the end about coding. I thought it was like fascinating. Like, what kind of art can we, can we create about coding? It's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I was also struck. I mean, so Joy creates this group called the Algorithmic Justice League, which I just love that title so much because I'm imagining they're dressed up like superheroes and fixing all the algorithms. Um, I. I think this idea of algorithmic bias is something, again, that humanists also are thinking about. So I think like, again, like just the fact that Joy happened to be the person that was using that software and that's why she made all these discoveries. I think that, again, this question of inclusion and EDI work that's being done in relationship, I think like there's so much work being done in relationship to coding with regard to that now. I think like taking those things into account is really important. Mm -hmm. And we are starting to see some of these jobs emerge. I mean, I think we have um, um, Yamna, who was one of our ACLS fellows a couple um, semesters ago, has been hired by Twitter to be, I believe, like an ethicist for Twitter. Um, for those of you who've seen like The Social Dilemma, Tristan Harris was like a Google ethicist. I am curious how much of these positions are... Um, you know, that the, the big companies are using as window dressing to like cover their multitude of sins and how much is it really incorporated into the development of the technologies and influencing the development of the technologies. And I don't know if anyone on the panel can speak to that, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think it's telling that one of the uh, AI researchers at Google who came out and criticized uh, the AI architecture was fired. I mean, mm -hmm. so there are, and, you know, she's a, a black woman um, and, you know, it would, it, it seemed like they were, they valued her input up until the point where she was openly critical of the company. And then when she was critical, they were like, you're gone. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I'm skeptical overall because the structures of power still remain um, and their bottom line is not to humanity or society is to their shareholders. Right. And it goes back to that question always, do we try to change things from within or without? I mean, Tristan Harris is a great example. He tried to work from within and then now he's working for the, I think it's the Center for Humane Technology working outside of, uh, you know, the companies. So do we have any more questions from the audience? I saw a, a comment from TJ, which made me laugh after um, Trevor was talking about you know, a robot having a seat at the table. TJ said, do we need an AI to regulate influence of AI on society? Maybe. I think, yeah, I think if, if we're talking about robot rights, I feel like there's a case to be made about that. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe not yet, but one day. <laughs> so another question I have for the panel, and, and this is not an easy question, but what is your vision for AI development in the future? How would you like to see the technology evolve? Uh, that's a tough question, but a couple things. One, I think we've kind of talked about this is we need some kind of overarching regulatory framework outside of private industry. Second, we need to have that, maybe that regulatory framework or some other entity be able to look at the code um, and see how they operate. And um, if they you know, if want to protect business interests, I understand, but they need to have some kind of um, ability for someone to take a look at the code outside of the company itself because then there's an independence there. Um, 
And third, then it's gotta be some kind of feedback mechanism for people who are on the wrong end of AI to be able to talk back. I think for me, since most of my research is in reference to you know creative projects used with AI, I think the ones that make me the most excited and least scared are the ones that um, are, are collaborations between human and non-human, you know, human and AI and creative endeavors. I think Eric Handman, you know, former fellow of, uh, of DM, I think his work with technology and creativity is, is a great example of that. And I think that just through collaboration, guardrails are, are already somewhat in place. And uh, and it's it's at a smaller scale that's, I think, more easy to control and more compelling creatively, at least. I love the mention of all of our fantastic former Digital Matters fellows. Like it just makes makes my heart so happy to, to think about all the great work that's come out of the lab. Let's see, TJ put another comment in uh, Facebook and TJ, I appreciate you interacting with us. Um, large language models are now generating code in production. Google has 10,000 plus programmers that accept 2.6% of AI generated code. Okay, so we, we only have a couple minutes left. If there's any other questions from the audience, we might have time for like one more question. Um, but I also just wanna throw it out to the panel, what I always do in the last couple minutes. Is there anything you wanna talk about that we haven't had a chance to discuss on this panel in regards to the film? Uh, can I offer one mock critique of the film? Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing that I was uh, concerned about is that I, did, I think the film did a great job about uh, centering um, the subjects on women, women of color, or people of color in general. Um, and they they use China and the UK as sort of case studies, comparative case studies, contextualized AI. And there were a lot of critics on the UK side of against AI, but on the China side, it was mostly like celebratory, or there was one woman who was the young skateboarder who was kind of seen as like somebody who drank all the Kool-Aid. Uh, and then you know, obviously there was like some uh, discussion about Hong Kong and how they, the protests there, the pro democracy protests are like strongly against surveillance, but there's nobody to speak for them. Like there's complete mm -hmm. absence there. I thought that was a real kind of missed opportunity. Mm. That was a great observation. Yeah, I always really appreciate, and TJ brought this up a little bit instead of David, I love the discussion of labor and, and workers involved with it as it relates to AI, because I think, um, you know, historically, we've thought that labor saving devices would create like a workers utopia, and that hasn't really been the case. So I think, you know, before we get to that point, before we just start outsourcing everything to AI, we, we really need to talk about what it can do to workers and, and, and poor people, especially. And I think that I would have liked to see that a little bit more in the documentary, but that's just kind of one thing I'm interested in. What about you, Sarah? Any final thoughts on the film or the issues? Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've never had a chance to teach coded bias, but I think about teaching it as you can imagine. And I feel like it's, I, I'd be really interested to show it in a classroom because I'd be really curious to see how people responded. And one of the things I would ask about is like, were you familiar with these issues before you saw the doc or, or are these things totally new to people? Like that's what I'm not sure. You know, she's made another film about TikTok called TikTok don't confuse it with Tick Tick Boom, which is also a great film. Tick Tock <laughs> Boom, which was at Sundance, I believe, last year. Um, so she, so this director is like making a name for herself by critiquing all of our technologies, which I think is really interesting. But I, I'm curious if people were already familiar with these issues and it just brings them to the fore, or are they totally new to people? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if you all know. Yeah. Yeah, I would also be curious how your students would respond because I found that, you know, different generations hold their privacy um, closer or less close, you know, and I find that um, like Gen Z, for example, they really never lived in a world where there's that much privacy, you know, in the library world, we're so protective of our patrons privacy, we don't keep records on what people check out. And it's funny how the next generation that almost feels like outdated of like, well, I, you could make you know, recommendations to me if you if you knew what I'd checked out previously. So I, I would be curious what your students would say in regards to the privacy and surveillance aspect of the film, as opposed to my intuition about it. So I think, yes, we have hit our one o'clock hour. I so appreciate our panelists engaging in this rich discussion. Um, thank you again to Eclectic Film uh, Committee for allowing us to, you know, to 
to highlight one of the films available and streaming in the Marriott Library. Um, I just appreciate you all being here, and I hope that this con conversation continues and that humanists continue to be engaged with issues of technology and artificial intelligence. Thank you all for joining us.